If you are watching this, then there's a pretty good chance that you are interested in battleships, if not Battleship Texas in particular. Be warned, this may not be for you if you have only a casual passing interest. Otherwise, pull your geek hats on. We're going to take a long and deep dive into the ship's fuel system changes and designs and how they contributed to Texas's ability to survive torpedo attacks. When Battleship Texas was commissioned, she and her sister ship New York were the most powerful warships in the world by virtue of the 10 14-inch guns that each carried. Their flesh deck design and five two-gun turrets gave them a clean, purposeful look that meant business. However, the ships were transitional designs that used a lot of older technology carried over from the late 1800s. This set them on the road to rapid obsolescence, especially with the introduction of the Nevada class and later ships. By far the most visible example of their aging technology was the coal-fired boilers that powered everything on board. At the very least, coal was filthy and produced clouds of dense black smoke that belched from her funnels when at full steam. Its soot covered the upper mast positions and settled onto every external surface of the ship. Besides the cleaning problems it created, the smoke made it possible to spot the ship even before it could be directly seen. Besides being a very dirty energy source, its quality and ability to fire boilers was highly variable and it was difficult to move and use. Among the many problems Cole presented was the necessity of manually handling it at every step. Taking on a 2,800-ton load of coal took the combined efforts of almost the entire crew and an entire day of back-breaking work. The work also required tying the ship up to a pier, barges, or a coaling ship while taking coal on board. Once fully loaded, another day was required to clean the coal dust off of both the inside and outside of the ship. Once on board, coal was stored in bunkers that lay on either side of the boiler rooms. This was an absolute necessity since it had to be moved one shovel load at a time from the bunkers and onto the floor of the boiler room by passers. From there, it was shoveled into the boiler fireboxes by stokers. There were a total of 28 coal bunkers on Texas. 14 lower bunkers extended along the sides of the boiler rooms and 14 additional upper bunkers were located above each of the lower ones. Chutes connected the upper bunkers to scuttles in the boiler rooms, and scuttles in the lower ones opened directly into the rooms so that coal could be evenly consumed from them all. Supplementing the coal were eight auxiliary fuel oil tanks in the bottom of the hull that could be used to spray oil into the boilers and increase steaming rate under extreme conditions. Unfortunately, there was an inherent structural problem with coal bunkers. They required large spaces that had openings into the boiler room. This combined to create a significant problem on Texas, which was the lack of adequate torpedo defense. Her design was little improved from that used in the late 1800s, where the primary defense against torpedoes were voids consisting of empty spaces along the outer hull. In the event of a torpedo hit, these gave room for unrestricted expansion and a place for at least a portion of an explosion to go to lessen the force that penetrated into the ship. However, it did little to really contain the effects of an underwater explosion. The design intent was that at least some of the explosion would dissipate in the void and the rest dissipated in the bunkers. Their bulkheads would be heavily damaged and the coal itself would help slow down the shrapnel and steel splinters created by the blast and the force further lessened as coal was pulverized. The end result would be destruction of the voids and bunkers at the blast site, but it was a worthwhile sacrifice if it saved the machinery and crew behind them from destruction. However, it also depended upon bunkers being full for best protection and there would still be some boiler room flooding through the coal scuttles since they were either being used or because they were blown open by the blast. Unfortunately, as torpedoes increased in destructive power, this protection fit in the category of wishful thinking and the more likely results were the loss of at least a couple of bunkers, the complete loss of a boiler room, and maybe the loss of the ship. By the beginning of the 1920s, these and other shortcomings placed Texas on the short list for retirement and scrapping after only six years of service. However, fate stepped in. The Washington Naval Arms Limitation Treaty of 1922 put a halt to new battleship construction for 10 years, and all new ships under construction were either scrapped or sunk as targets. With no new replacement ships in sight, the Navy gave Texas a new lease on life. At the end of July 1925, Texas went into dry dock where she underwent a major modernization that included replacing the coal-fired boilers with new oil-fired units. <laughs>
In order to start work, her superstructure, smoke pipes, and masts were removed along with major portions of the main second and third decks. This exposed the boiler rooms so that they could be stripped of their boilers and bulkheads, leaving a giant open space ready for change. Once the spaces were fully open, new longitudinal bulkheads were installed in the former lower bunker spaces. These were much more than standard weight. Instead of the normal quarter-inch steel, they were made of thick three-quarter-inch steel that served as splinter armor. Next, new boiler room bulkheads were installed in board of the armor, and the upper coal bunkers were repurposed as crew berthing spaces. This gave several hundred crew an additional place to sleep that was away from the noise and traffic of ship operations. Six oil-fired boilers were then put in place along with the steam and fuel lines within the rooms. These were capable of producing more steam than the 14 coal-fired boilers, and because of the reduction, it was only necessary to have three boiler rooms instead of four. The leftover space forward of the three new rooms was put to excellent use as a well-protected location for the main battery plotting room. The new Bureau Express oil-fired small water tube boilers were a tremendous improvement over the old Babcock and Wilcox coal-fired units. Besides leading to the elimination of a boiler room, the reduction from 14 to 6 boiler exhaust uptakes meant that the ship only needed one smokestack instead of two. With the boiler rooms in place, the next step was to reinstall the armored second and third decks, the main deck, and create tanks in which large quantities of fuel oil could be stored. To begin, a void was created using the narrow space between the splinter armor and boiler room bulkheads. The space on the outboard side of the armor became an oil tank. That narrow void filled two critical roles. One was to act as protection in the event of a fuel tank rupture. Instead of oil gushing into a boiler room, it would be contained within the void. The void also served as an excellent location to run large fuel lines that connected all of the tanks and served the boiler rooms. It also contained scores of valves that permitted fuel to be drawn off of any tank, fill tanks, or transfer fuel between them. Another interesting thing to notice is the difference between the bulkheads. The lighter weight boiler room bulkhead at the bottom of the photo uses overlapping steel plates joined by a double row of rivets. The heavier three-quarter inch bulkhead at the top used butt joints with wide joiner plates and up to six rows of rivets. Looking into one of the fuel tanks, you can see a valve at the bottom with a rod connected that reaches up to the top of the tank. This valve allowed fuel to be drawn 18 inches from the bottom of the tank to avoid picking up solids that settled out of the oil. It could be switched to feed directly off of the bottom during emergency conditions or when cleaning the tanks. Additional lines ran through the tanks to provide feed and suction to tanks that lay out board. Notice that they are curved. In the event of a torpedo strike and explosion, the curves would allow the pipes to simply fold up instead of being driven like spears through inner bulkheads. A glance at the drawing suggests that only having tanks along the outside of the boiler rooms did not provide nearly enough total fuel capacity. Fortunately, one advantage of fuel oil is that it could be stored anywhere on the ship where a tank could be placed and reached with pipes and valves. Because of this greater capability, the original voids that lay outside of the original coal bunkers were caulked to tank standards and repurposed as fuel tanks. Looking into one, you can see two fuel lines and valves. One serves this tank, and the other serves an additional tank located beneath it. In order to get maximum amount of fuel on board and to serve another purpose we'll soon discuss, even portions of the ship's inner bottom where it curves up to meet the bottom of the belt armor was turned into fuel tanks. By looking through a manhole on the third deck, we can see the upper portion kept as a void behind the belt armor. You can even see some of the nuts and studs in the hull plating at the top of the photo that holds the armor in place. The open manhole at the bottom of the void opens into the fuel tank that extends down and along the inner curve of the lower hull. By extending the tanks fore and aft along the hull, the ship now had adequate fuel storage capacity. However, this created a major problem. The fuel tanks now extended inward from the outer hull shell plate almost to the boiler rooms. This meant that there was no longer an outer void to help dissipate the effects of a torpedo strike and underwater explosion. Without the void, the shock and explosion of a torpedo hit could pulse through the liquids and destroy bulkheads along the way.
even the splinter armor would likely be defeated and the boiler room bulkhead ruptured. This would lead to major oil and seawater flooding and the loss of a boiler room. In order to correct the problem, a torpedo blister was added to the outside of the hull. The unrestricted expansion space was regained and the oil tanks became part of the solution rather than part of the problem. The intent of the design was that much of an explosion at the blister would be dissipated by its open spaces and the easily collapsed divisions. While considerable force would still be transmitted into the oil, the liquid in bulkheads could handle its reduced effect and also absorb the considerable amount of flying steel splinters produced by shattered blister, hull, and tank walls. The result is complete destruction of the blister and fuel tanks at the site of the explosion, but destruction would stop at the splinter armor. While that armor would also be damaged and certainly have serious leaks at its riveted joints, the leaks would be contained within the void that directly protected the boiler rooms. By extending both tanks and external blisters along most of the hull's length, the ship now had a basic torpedo defense system that was a vast improvement over what previously existed. While it still wasn't as good as the protective systems found on later ships, it was likely good enough to prevent the loss of the ship after being hit by one or two torpedoes. Along with 92 new fuel oil tanks, a network of pipes was required to move oil to and from them. This consisted of more than 2,000 feet of pipe and hundreds of fittings that formed fuel mains and cross connects, along with scores of individual suction lines to each tank. In order to properly route oil, more than 200 valves were installed that controlled each tank, created numerous routes for suction and fill functions, and isolate individual tanks and sections of fuel line that may be damaged. A torpedo hit on this system would certainly take out more than one tank. It would also likely disable large sections of fuel line that would require isolation of the damage and rerouting of fuel so that all boilers would continue to burn. But this problem and solution raised yet another problem, which was the loss of fuel capacity. Since it was very possible that heavy damage to the fuel supply may cut deeply into the ship's operational capabilities, emergency fuel tanks were created in the inner hull in the bottom of the ship. The original eight auxiliary fuel tanks located in the bottom after the boiler rooms were repurposed as emergency tanks and eight more were created further aft of those. Two additional emergency tanks were placed close to the bow of the ship and ahead of the newly created fuel oil service tanks. Those four service tanks were a critical part of the boiler fuel feed system because preheated oil was stored and drawn from them. It was then run through one last set of strainers and heaters before going to the boiler's burners. The ship that started out with 28 coal bunkers and 8 auxiliary fuel oil tanks now had a total of 92 fuel oil tanks along with pipes and valves used to move fuel around. However, control linkages and another important set of pipes were still missing. These are shown as solid red lines and blue dotted lines on the drawing. The blue dotted lines on the drawing indicate reach rods that connected valves located deep in the bottom of the ship to remote operators on the third deck where they could be easily reached. With these operators, valves could be quickly opened or closed in combinations that provided suction to feed the boilers, fill the tanks, or transfer fuel from one tank to another. The operators are neatly spaced and labeled with tags along passageways on the third deck allowing them to be identified and set according to need. A look at the other side of the bulkhead shows gears connecting the operators to reach rods that extend through the deck on their way to the valves. From the third deck, they enter voids outside of the boiler rooms and reach down more than 20 feet to attach to the valves. Reach rods also connected to valves on top of the inner hull and more remote locations within the ship. This valve stands above the top of an inner bottom tank. Its high and low suction lines penetrate the tank top to either suck oil off of the bottom of the tank or 18 inches above the bottom to avoid the sediment that collects there. There is yet another set of pipes that must go to each tank. These are the air escape lines indicated with the solid red lines. Whenever oil is added or removed from a tank, Air must also move in or out of it to fill space not occupied by oil. Otherwise, it would not only be difficult to pump the oil, large changes in air pressure would certainly create leaks in the tank wall seams. 
Therefore, air escape lines were attached to the top of each tank, then combined into larger lines to give air and oil vapors an escape route to the outside of the ship at the main deck level. This both equalized pressure within the tanks and kept toxic oil fumes out of the ship's interior. Here are a couple of air escape lines coming off of the tops of two tanks close to the outside of the hull. Each also includes an inline cutoff valve. One use for the valve was to close and seal the tank while pressure testing it for leaks. Lastly, it was very important to have a way to directly check the oil level in each tank. This was done through openings in the top of each tank where they met the third deck. Once open, a sounding line could be dropped through the opening down to the bottom of the tank and its fuel level measured. Tanks located in the inner bottom could not be directly accessed, so sounding tubes were installed that reached from the third deck through interfering tanks and into the bottom tanks. Operating 92 tanks, thousands of feet of suction and transfer lines, and hundreds of control valves likely made this the most complicated system on the ship. On the surface, its complexity would appear to make it almost unmanageable. Fortunately, there are ways of dealing with it. Here is a partial shot of a status board used by the Oil King, who is the officer in charge of the system. With that, he and his crew could use pegs inserted at each tank to show its general fuel level and the status of each cutoff valve in the system. This gave a ready reference and clearly visible tools that allowed the team to monitor fuel levels and make fast decisions. A closer look reveals the identity of specific tanks, the overall height of each tank, which is important in determining fuel level, and the maximum amount of fuel each tank was capable of storing. The system worked well when everything was operating as intended and the crew was not under the extreme pressure of combat. However, combat required the worst conditions be anticipated and the Oil King and his crew had to know how to immediately deal with any contingency. This complicated system could not be adequately managed under these conditions, especially if there was serious damage requiring immediate corrective action. This meant that the system had to be made simple and there had to be careful planning and a clear procedure that dealt with every imaginable problem. There were written procedures for every division on the ship used to set combat conditions and respond to any combination of equipment casualties. While we have not found those for the fuel system, there is one set of plans that suggest its combat settings. When looking at the plan, you can see six heavily accented fuel tanks. Each of these were referred to as a battle tank that had an additional fuel line and cutoff valve separate from the rest of the system. These lines extend directly into the boiler rooms where they feed into a major suction line that runs within the rooms. The remaining 86 fuel tanks and piping system would be closed off and not used. The result was boiler rooms now drew off of six well-protected tanks that maintained a continuous feed while isolated from any damage that may occur to the rest of the system. A little quick calculating suggests that these provided enough capacity to operate the boilers for as long as a full day at cruising speeds or six hours at full output. If one of the battle tanks were damaged, it could be immediately shut off by the boiler room crew and the boilers would continue to operate on the five remaining tanks. The Oil King monitored battle tank levels and if operations extended beyond the tank's capacities, he could refill them by drawing fuel through a relay tank and strainers on the third deck from tanks in the rest of the system. Once this and other work was finished, the modernization of Battleship Texas was complete. She re-entered service with fuel and steam systems as good as the newest ships of the line, and her torpedo protection was improved so that she could reliably survive a torpedo hit. Perhaps the most impressive thing about the conversion and all of the changes was the high level of engineering and skill of the shipyard craftsmen that worked on Texas. She left dry dock only 16 months after entering it with a new lease on life and the ability to make major contributions in World War II that fully justified the cost and efforts that went into saving her.